eight yep. hours, huh? There you go. Uh, yeah. So I'm well, I guess I'm a little that. late. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, and, uh, you need to show that. Um, double check that. So okay, I do, cool. I've been, I have this open source uh, project called Nereal, and it's uh, merging, um, basically merging uh, cryptocurrency with big data. So uh, predictive analytics. So the idea is that everybody um, can uh, participate and share in the uh, value created uh, through the through uh, big data and AI algorithms. So, yeah. <laughs> rather than rather than creating algorithms just to get to a random number, it's actually creating valuable algorithms that can be used for mm -hmm. many other things. And, well, and it, and it, 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 it basically the idea is it spreads the the value proposition out. It gives everybody a chance to participate. Um, in the world. So um, just like Bitcoin has the world's largest supercomputer that was created because of that model. I mean by a massive amount. I mean bigger than anything else there. Um, I plan to with the real um, do the same thing with uh, AI algorithms and critical downloads. In essence. I mean, I don't know how better to say it. I'm not yeah, yeah. else. <laughs> yeah. um, anyway, it's I, I don't get up in front of people to talk about it much, really. Although I'm the flag bearer, it's not mainly online. What's the problem? Uh, Nureal. So it's N E U R E A L. Yeah. It's pretty exciting. I've been doing it for about two years now. Um, we've grown, grown a community. Uh, online we have um, uh, it's it's kind of a really efficient way to go about growing something that big because it gives everyone a chance to be a part of it it's kind of like peer-to-peer -peer funding in a sense it brings a peer-to-peer -peer funding model to the to the space um, anybody can participate anybody can uh, uh, be a part of it in different ways and have different roles as investors, as uh, as you know, algorithm providers, um, as data providers, as you know, it's basically an infrastructure kind of a kind of a system that um, uh, that everybody can utilize. It's 100% open source. Um, you know, it runs on the cryptocurrency blockchain model, uh, so it has integrity in that respect. Use that for its integrity. Um, yeah, so it's uh, it's pretty exciting. We we have it to the point right now uh, where we have a prototype, um, and we're kind of in the growing phase where we're trying to uh, get contributors and get more people involved in the project. Um, you know, we're out there just trying to as a if you look at it as a startup, we're in the raising money phase. So, uh, you know, that's where we're going. With it. We've, we've uh, um, brought a lot of new, pe some new people on board who are going to go about that. Um, anyway, so we're just trying to, oh, Elon Musk, you guys have probably heard that recent thing about open AI. I don't know if you guys have all heard that. Elon Musk and all of my commenter guys and all those guys. They're doing the open AI thing, so pulling a bunch of people together with a bunch of money. Um, billion dollars. Yeah, billion dollars. That's what they're saying. So we're we're kind of a competitor to that in a sense because um, you know we offer the value proposition where they they you know the integrated uh, profit motive where they don't, uh, which is a different kind of take on the whole thing. Um, you know this idea of giving everybody access to, you know, I find your lack of data disturbing. Everyone, everyone, it should be disturbing that everyone doesn't have it, right? Yeah. It should be for everyone, not the, not the few, not the, just, a, just a few people. Everyone should have access to that. And so that's what the idea of it is. Cool. Yeah. Uh, I'm Pat Wright. Um, I help organize many of these different things. You'll see me at the different events. Um, I also work for Merit CX. Um, we do um, customer service and success of the customer. 
So we have lots and lots of different data about lots and lots of different customers for our SaaS-based platform. So we have tons of uh, um, lots of the same schema, but lots of different data from each different spot point. We're working into predictive here very soon. So we're getting more and more into the data science side of things. Um, personally, I've been working on it anyways for a while um, because I've been attending most of these uh, frequently. So um, since we are now on Google Hangouts, um, the mic is right there. Um, please try to speak up a little bit. Um, let's ask her to repeat the question whenever we can remember to as well. So. Okay, that sounds good. Okay. Okay. Um, so I've just been shown these first two slides uh, since the Hangout started, so I'll just continue from here. Um, so I graduated uh, with my PhD in 2013 uh, in Ohio, and I moved back to Utah. And my first job was with Zion Spain Corp. I was on the fraud and security analytics team. And I did, uh, in the beginning, a lot of uh, just VI reporting. So I learned SQL. Um, and they have a Hadoop and Hive platform there. So I was accessing data and uh, aggregating all that, that data for reports. I did a lot of ETL work there, which I actually love a lot. So if you don't know what ETL is, extract, transform, and load. So I really love being able to use some kind of a language like Python and reach into some system like Oracle, pull out what I want, reform it, and then stick it somewhere else where I can use it for whatever I need it to. I just find that process very enjoyable and fascinating. Um, so I did do some R there as well. Um, one of the bigger projects that I was on was uh, wires processing. Um, it was a big deal because a lot of wires get stopped for potential, uh, I don't want to say potential fraud, um, but it has to get checked against like the, the federal terrorist list. And these have to be checked with human eyeballs on every single wire that gets stopped. Mm -hmm. So that takes a lot of time. Um, and it turns out for companies that send a lot of wires, if all of their wires get stopped because they have they get hit by the same rule every time, and it's definitely not fraudulent or terrorist, then um, it just gets released. So I basically was automating a process that would aggregate all of the company's wires, show the Zion's employees why this company's wires were getting stopped, which rule was stopping them, and then they would be able to um, do whatever they were going to do with that. I actually handed off those results to somebody else, so I don't know in the wire side how, um, how it went after that. But it was going to um, reduce the number of hours that the employees had to spend doing that. There were several full-time employees doing just manually, visually checking wires that they were not fraudulent. And so this was going to um, reduce their time that they had to spend doing that and let them do other activities in the wires department. Um, after Zions, I went to Inside Sales. And Inside Sales is a company that sells predictive um, technology, tools, software to um, sales teams. So if, if you're a company that wants to know who you should call out of all of your leads, um, Inside Sales is a great tool. Um, it basically every hour refreshes your leads list and tells you who you should be calling. And it's based on a number of different factors um, that literally can change every hour. Um, so it puts your, your most likely candidates at the top of the list for you to call. Uh, the next hour it refreshes, you'll see a different list of people to call. Um, I was a research scientist there. That's what they call us, a data scientist. Um, I did a lot of ETL work there and a lot of Python. Uh, again, I worked in a lot of SQL. Um, they have a Hadoop and uh, HBase environment there. So I got some uh, hands-on experience doing that. <clears throat> After Inside Sales, I started working at a company earlier this year called CompuCom. Um, I had never heard of them. Most people I talk to have never heard of them. They've been around for about 30 years, and what they do is um, they basically are a service company for IT equipment. So yes, they do sell equipment, um, but it comes through other providers like Dell or HP or Apple or whatever. And then um, they are the service team, like if you need to call tech support or if your motherboard dies, 
um, this is the company that you call. And um, so this year, a new team was formed. Uh, we're called Digital Innovation. And um, I have kind of two roles there. I'm a data scientist. I'm also the thing that they call a PSM, a Portfolio Service Manager. So what in the world does that mean? Well, a portfolio service to them is a tool that they license from another company. And the one that I'm in charge of was supposed to be over recommendations. Um, we settled on Neo4j. It's a graph database that's very powerful for what it does. And some of my responsibilities are to make sure that the data science ideas are possible and that the company goes in the right direction with these ideas. Um, I also manage an Indian development team. Um, so that's new to me. It's very interesting. Um, it's going very well, even though we're 12 and a half hours different in time. Um, so what are we doing there? We're creating a new service experience. So the IT service has been about the same for the last 30 years. Um, and with all of the data possible, we are tracking stuff about users and the devices that they have purchased from us. Um, we want to create personas around uh, who is like who else? What do they use? Why do they use it? What apps do they have installed? How often do they call service? What device are they calling about? How much does that cost their company? How much does it cost our company? And uh, I, I think it's fascinating. And I'm pretty amazed that they haven't been doing that already. But it's a big step for them. It's a really big company. And it takes a lot of effort to change um, a big group of people to do something new. And um, we're, we're starting to get to some really exciting times. Um, some things that we want to deliver are actual products. So um, a lot of people in this room are very like each other. So for, for example, if I want to uh, visit the portal and it says uh, it's going to recommend to me some products. Well, how is it going to do some product recommendations? It's going to look in the, uh, in the graph at other people who are in there and um, decide, well, I am most like other people, let's say this room. It'll say, well, what products have all of you guys bought? It returns some kind of a list, and then it will just tell me whichever ones I have already not purchased. Maybe it's stuff I've heard of, maybe it's stuff I haven't heard of. Um, and it's supposed to help these people do their, uh, it's also based on job title or role, so um, it helped people do their job better potentially. Um, so a future thing that I want to do, something I've thought about, uh, I've done a little bit with, and would love to do some more, is game analytics. So I like to design games. Um, I've made a couple of video games. Um, I've also made some like board games. It's harder to do data tracking on those. Um, uh, anyway, um, I, I did set up a way to capture data. Uh, it turned out to be a bigger project than I realized it would be. Um, so. I, I would love to either just start with some, so I mentioned I have a video game, so just collect it somehow using something else like uh, set up something on Amazon where there are, are a lot of game um, analytics trackers uh, that I can start to use. But I think of what kinds of things would I want to track. So uh, if it's my game, I know how I want people to play my game. And through analytics, I would be able to track certain metrics and see are people spending the right amount of time in certain parts of my game, or are they getting stuck somewhere? You can figure that stuff out. Uh, you can figure out game length or user retention, all that kind of stuff. Um, also, um, I, I think that uh, fraudulent behavior is something that's very interesting and something that you can detect and do something about. Um, I was really interested in a talk that I heard from um, I forget which company or game it was. It was a first-person shooter that actually has tournaments, and they give away prizes, real money, trucks, really important things, and they don't want people to um, play their game fraudulently. So um, they tracked user behavior, and they had in-game footage of people doing fraudulent behavior. I was so fascinated to see that. So, for example, in a first-person shooter, you get points by killing people. You also get extra points for shooting them in the head. So what people would do is they would somehow when the computer teams up people, they go into the, the room, they start the game, somehow these players know or team up with somebody on the other team to wander over to some unexplored part of the map where people just aren't going to walk by and catch them 
and they take turns shooting each other in the head and getting a lot of points. Well, the game company doesn't like that because these people are going to earn a lot of prizes and it's going to ruin the experience for other people. Um, so for all of these reasons and many more, I love data, data science, analytics. I love thinking in this way. Um, I would spark some questions for you guys. Um, I don't know how we're going to do this on Hangouts, if anybody's going to ask something or, or chatting or something. I'm watching questions. OK, cool. Um, so that's my last slide, and I'm happy to answer any and all questions So about my experience or what you think is cool or how to go toward which, what kind of solution you need. Are you reporting? Are you getting uh, use of things, I guess, for the ETL, something like Ben Fahos or something like that? Are you using that? Um, I did not, but um, at my current job, we're using something called Talent. It's, oh. I think it's a Pentaho uh, competitor. So uh, do you find yourself, um, you know, with Hadoop data and things like that, do you find yourself having to extract for the reporting instead of just directly try to get you know, the data out? And how do you, you know, how, with the new design that we're having, you know, for the, the product that we're doing right now, we're basing it, 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 the, kind of the, the, the main um, repository on uh, Mongo. You know, so there's some of the challenges that we have is, you know, the clients have a really complex um, reporting uh, and data analytics. So, you know, getting directly from from uh, Mongo's, it's you know, it's going to be pretty difficult. So, we're thinking of putting into more of kind of a secondary, uh, okay. you know, uh, uh, repository where it's kind of become a reporting uh, repository. You know, is that that type? Is that the type of patterns or? That, that you usually that do, do with things like that. Yeah, so um, your question makes me think that I, I've actually never started with a data set that was in the format that I needed to do my job. Mm -hmm. So there's always some kind of a, um, some kind of a massaging or cleaning, especially cleaning, remove all the corrupted data. Um, and most of the time, I'd say 80 to 90 percent of the time spent on a project is trying to figure out what format is your data in, transforming it, getting it to how you want it, in the place that you want it, and maybe even write some new tools to do what you need to do on it. Um, and then once you actually push the go button, that's going to give you the answer to that part is very fast. Mm -hmm. so, right. There's a lot of art as well as science in this, you know, coming up with the right models, the right pipeline, um, and even, in, you know, when you're on um, cluster analysis or something to, to, to come up with your personas. So um, how, how did you develop the skills that involved the art, you know, the design, you know, the intuition? That's a great question. Um, so I'll try to repeat the question. So where did I get my skills um, to handle both the, the artistic approach and also the, the, the hard science approach? So um, did I capture that okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so the artistic side, I think, just takes practice and seeing what works, what doesn't work. And so you gain an intuition um, for that kind of thing. And it's definitely paired with tools or with math. And you need to just get a feel for yourself. It's kind of hard to share that with somebody else, just like it's hard to make somebody else become an artist, even if you're really passionate about it. Um, and so you kind of just, it's kind of trial and error, but I feel like because my experience is in trial and error to, you know, doing actual research science, that I am pretty comfortable with that and, and feel like. Are I'm there certain that. collaborations that helped or was this something you did on your own? Um, so going through grad school is pretty much a one person show. Uh, you do have an advisor and so, and you have other people around you, other students, but they don't know what you're working on. Right. You may ask them, hey, how do you, you know, um, debug, I have this error message, help me fix it or whatever. Um, I, um, so I, I relied on my advisor for you know, some language, some debugging, but mostly the astronomy side. Um, but just being around, just attending talks, other you know, science um, presentations, you just get familiar with that kind of a world. So same thing in data science, if you're on a team, 
people are doing stuff, people are talking, you're going to learn about tools, what works for them, what algorithms work or don't work. Um, if something took forever, so for example, I wrote a whole bunch of code in C that I'm never going to use again. And only a few people on my advisor's team, all his new students, are probably the only people that are going to use it. Um, so um, I can't build on top of that. But at the end of grad school, I heard about Python. And Python is this amazing thing to me because it, it would have shaved off years off of my degree because I would have not written many things. Um, so some of the, the algorithms I used were principal component analysis. I did some singular value decomposition. Um, so just being around a couple algorithms for a couple years gives some, you some really deep insight. Um, so I can draw a little bit from that experience and apply it in other areas. It's not a whole lot. Um, but when I see some kind of a problem where I think that would apply, it immediately comes to mind. And so I'll you know, bring it up to whoever's doing uh, that work on that problem. Um, so also being around uh, math and statistics for so long, I, I wouldn't call the same statistics that statistics people call statistics, um, but mathematical methods and probabilities and stuff. Um, so all that gives me some kind of insight to different problems. And if there's a problem where like probability is a part of it, I can identify it immediately because I have a lot of that kind of experience. So hopefully that answers the art plus the science. Coming I gotta, together. I gotta add one part on the creativity too, is I keep running into more and more data scientists that have a creative background somewhere in them. You design a game, you design a game. You you play them, obviously, board games, things like that, other creativity. I have a data scientist on my team, which I don't know if we call him a data scientist right now, but he is. Um, he goes nuts at Halloween, completely redesigns the office. This year was an entire nightmare before Christmas, terribly creative, fluorescent, everything. It just dumps tons and tons of creativity into it. I keep finding more and more of them that have that creative gene inside them or that creative bone that goes one step further. So it's not just all about the math and the probabilities and everything else, there is that creative element that makes them different, that, that gives them that edge. Mm -hmm. So I, I just bring that up because I keep seeing it in our community and everywhere else. When when you find a really good data scientist, they have this weird creative background as well that they're doing something else. <laughs> yeah. so. I can add on to that before your comment. Um, so yes, I do have some creativity um, and other kinds of aspects that, that keep me, well, not keep me away, but give me another perspective. So I happen to have a black belt in martial arts. Uh, that's given me a very different perspective. So I'm not always on math and programming. Um, and I also paint little miniatures because I think it's fun. So I actually do have a lot of creativity um, in my past. And yeah. I wish I could do more of that stuff. So anyway, uh, Jensen. I wanted to know what, uh, what kind of tools or resources do you have as best practices for that ETL side of the equation? So for, okay, the question is, what's uh, best tools or practices for ETL? Um, for me, I always start with Python because I usually have something um, that's, it's stored somewhere. It's either in a MySQL database or Oracle, or I haven't really used Mongo too much, but you have some format, it could even be a CSV, it could be a malformed CSV. Those, those are a lot of fun. Um, and I, I start with Python, either to connect to an Oracle database or, now this is for a really long drawn out ETL project, but something simple, I just use SQL, pull it out, do what I need to do, give a report. Um, so if I really need to do an ETL, I, I do Python. And uh, I, I'm sure some people do R. I know a lot of people are happy with R for, for everything. Um, I think Python is better for me because I have a coding background and I just like how Python feels. Correct me if I'm wrong, but R doesn't have near as many connectors as Python does already already baked into it. Somebody can correct me there. But I don't know of a lot of R to SQL or R to Oracle right now. They're coming, but I don't think that they're there nearly as much. Um, I would I don't know which ones are there and which ones are not, but I do know that there's there's been a competition between Python and R on a lot of different fronts for a long time, and so they're all being worked on. Um, so no, I, I couldn't answer which ones are there. Um, there, I mean, I just saw today there is an R to Neo 4J right. connector, <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, there's PySpark, but there isn't something 
for our in spark yet. Well, know. there is something. I don't know if it's still incubation, but it will, seems like it'll always be behind. Amount of people using it, right? Right. Are there any default libraries or anything you go to for the processing, the analysis work? Um, yeah, so for let, let me start at the end. So for visualizations, Matplotlib uh, is what I go to. Um, uh, a new one that it just went open source is called Plotly. Um, so I've been looking at that this week. What's it called? Plotly, plot.ly. Um, uh, R has something called Shiny that I think is totally awesome. If I were more of an R user, I'd be using Shiny. Shiny. Uh -huh. It's a way that you, it's, Shiny is an R add-on, let me call it, and it creates dashboards for you in HTML using R code in your R results. So that's why I say if I were more into R, I would be using that, but because I'm learning Python, I use Matplotlib and I'm checking out Plotly. There's a, there's a bunch of new ones, too. There's there's one called Gephi that's uh, a French company, <coughs> open source project. It's yep. super easy to use. Um, it's not uh, it's not as pretty as Shiny is or has as many options. And, yeah. Anyway, there's a whole bunch of so Python, you use? Which Python? So, yeah, so well, Python, you use Plotly, and what else? Uh, Matplotlib for visualizations. Mm -hmm. Do you, are you pretty much on the 2.x Python? Yeah, 2.7. Do you use Anaconda? Um, I've used it a tiny bit. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, you don't see value with it? I, at the time, I'm trying to remember why I didn't go more with it. It's not that I was turned off for any reason. I thought it was kind of a, there's a time barrier to entry and I need to get something done. I think I was looking for a specific library that would have, mm. I think I was just trying to install something to get something else mm. to work. I couldn't get pip install to work, couldn't get mm -hmm. uh, a couple of the other ones, easy install or uh, there's another one, applicate or something. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, okay, maybe this one will work. And so that's really the only reason I tried it. Right. Um, yeah, I, that, that's one thing with Python is the installations are, can be a lot more challenging than R. Yeah, I've seen they've gotten better um, in the last like year, maybe. Mm -hmm. At least I found it easier to install the ones that I need to install okay. with less problems. Um, Jim mentioned on the line to R Studio, R Studio Server, Shiny, and Shiny Apps. That I am. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. Things. Yeah. So you can actually upload your own data onto ShinyApps.io, and they'll they'll host those for you, I believe, and then you can mm -hmm. share the link with anybody else that you want to on your team or, mm -hmm. or whoever. For your ETL uh, using Python, do you have any additional? Tools that you add to them to help you with it, or just straight Python. Or? Um, I'd have to think. So it's definitely heavy on the Python. Okay, sorry. So the question is, do I use anything else besides Python for ETL? Um, a lot of times things are in my SQL, and so I use SQL to start. Maybe I need to um, get first results out. Maybe I don't need a whole table out of my SQL, but certain columns, certain rows. Uh, I start with that data set. Maybe I just export that to a CSV, load it into Python after that. Uh, Pandas is another awesome um, thing. It's like a, our data frame. I think it was designed after that. Um, so uh, to me, that's Python. It's, some people may think Pandas is a little different, but. Um, Do you scrape stuff offline? And oh, man. I have. It's very painful. <laughs> yes, I had a scraping project at Inside Sales, and um, the internet is not formatted nicely. <laughs> <laughs> it's just off web pages, HTML. Mm -hmm. I actually went back to our presentation during the air quality competition. I think Ben did that, didn't, didn't you do that? When you're showing how to scrape scrape from web, or maybe it was out to the Oh, oh I think I. I yeah, you did some of yeah, it. Yeah, getting yeah. to the data and stuff. Oh, They're not goodness. giving you data. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there's ways no. to get it. Yeah. Oh my goodness! <laughs> I went back to that and watched some of that. I'm like, wow, this is nasty. Yeah, <laughs> like the whole yeah. EPA that's, side. Yeah, that's why you have to use the sleep function because you don't want you don't want them getting upset because you're shut <laughs> yes. you down. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, they'll block you, so then you can't get in. Well, especially in, like LinkedIn and Twitter and all those have gotten tighter and tighter with it. And even you know, LinkedIn's APIs are now all getting shut down. Yeah. But if you can see it, you can scrape it. Right? Yeah. yeah. 
So when you say you scrape it, sorry about that. When you say you scrape, um, are you going through the API or 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 you just no. scrape? Just scrape. Yeah. Parts of the HTML, right? Yeah, we these guys Alton did a presentation or Ben did a presentation on that last year. I was up on YouTube. So if you need that, there's a, a beautiful soup library. Yeah. Called soup. Beautiful, beautiful soup. soup. For Python? Yeah. Uh, there's another one. I'll see if I can remember it. Scrapey. Mm. Scrapey. Yes. Just Python exactly. libraries yeah. and PY very often, so Scrapey. Um, I couldn't decide which beautiful soup or Scrapey was going to be better for me. They both did different things uh, a little better than each other, so do a little bit of both. I did not bring up good memories from my past. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> some trauma there. Yeah, there. Some so some you, emotional yeah. issues. Is there a way you could boil down some of the things that you feel like have been the most successful in your career? Right, like you know, if you talk about recommendations, uh, was it really uh, you know simplifying things to the point where you just said, "Hey, I'm going to identify that this is what a similar user is going to look like. This is." how many things they've purchased and this is what they haven't purchased yet. Was it identifying that um, that pattern of making that as simple as possible that, that was more successful or what? I mean, uh, yeah. just kind of let you go. So, okay, so specifically for, um, for identifying like personas or clustering people and then seeing who else matches them. So uh, one thing I learned um, at Inside Sales was um, once you create a model, so you start with some data, you split your data uh, and maybe maybe not 50 50 maybe 70 30 or 80 20 or something you create your model off of a chunk of your data and then you validate it on a, a portion of it that you did, did not create your model with so um, from there once you have a model <clears throat> I um, I thought it was pretty clever that um, you, you basically store the, the model results, which are just a bunch of numbers or vectors. And when you have a new user or a new something that you want to score against that model, you don't have to like run it through anything long and complicated. You have a result. And you just bounce your new data off of it, and you see what the result is. So if it's personas, say I have you know, 10 or 20 personas or whatever, they all have some uh, numerical representations. If I have a new person come along, maybe somebody just created a new login for our site, and we want to know something about them. Well, I don't want to make a model off of everybody again plus one person. I just want to see who is this person most like, and I want to put him into one of my clusters. So you just score them. And uh, anyway, for some reason, that it just seems so simple, but so powerful at the same time. Um, I guess that's the value proposition because now, I mean, as a business, you can immediately classify and sort of anticipate how to interact with this new customer. Yeah. And so, uh, one thing that I think that I brought value to our team is that if you have a new user, what do you do with them if you don't know enough about them to classify them somewhere else? Mm -hmm. So, um, I, my solution was well, let's create kind of a misfit. A persona mm. and everybody in there <laughs> is different than everybody else you can't tailor something that they're more likely to respond to but at least it's a bucket that we can give generic content to mm. maybe you start delivering kind of a B test to these people to gather more information about them and then maybe every day you just rescore them rescore them eventually they'll fit in with the group somewhere mm. Or create their own. Could be a new one. Yeah. So if we run this periodically, then yeah, you're going to have um, people that start behaving differently than they did in the beginning. So they'll join a different group. New groups will form, old, old ones will disappear. With problem solving, um, and I know we're running out of time here, but with problem solving, is there a certain way that you like to approach problems in general that you follow a pattern or a method that you approach every time or at least close to it? Yeah, I do. So um, I like to understand what's in a data set. So if somebody, so if the business approaches me and says, hey, 
I want to do this great thing. This will be a really big deal for us. Um, and they describe the, the scenario or situation and they tell me what answer they want out. That all sounds good from far away, but I needed to solve that problem. I need to see what's in the data. So I need to just look at it, open it up, look at the CSV, look at the, load it into a pandas object and just look at it. That just by eye, I can see, well, what kinds of values are in here? What kind of data do we have? What kind of columns do we have? Um, do we have a lot of categorical things or a lot of numerical things? Because we handle those very differently. Um, but I, and I will get more ideas once I understand what is in the data. I can match that to what they're asking me to do. I will very often have more ideas for solving other problems as we go along. Um, and to, to add on to that, I also want to say that I, it just doesn't work when the business or anybody says, hey, solve this problem, here's some data, because I don't know the business as well as the business person, and they don't know the data like I know it. So I really enjoy the two-way communication, sometimes over a long period of time, so that I understand their side, and they may not think they can understand my side, but I, I know that they can, and through time and visualizations and just explaining results, um, I think the business people can really understand and appreciate um, the data science side. Um, so that's that's how I, that's like the ideal for me. That's the, the end. Yeah. But I should say that from what I've seen, that's where most of your success has come from, is being able to really communicate, get them on the same route, help them understand why it's valuable. Glad you can so see you that. That's what I try to do. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Anything okay. else? We're about at the end of my hour. All right. All right. Thanks, Ken. Yeah, you're welcome. Are you going to post your email? <laughs> What's that? You have the email. Oh, am I going to post my email? Yeah. I better stick my email on there. <laughs> well, I think everybody was on this email chain, so oh, that's, okay, that's right. Another <laughs> on there, so.